In this video, we're going to introduce Planck's law. I want to talk about Planck's law in the context of one of the classic failures of classical mechanics. And in order to talk about this, I want to put us back into what was the prevailing physical wisdom of classical mechanics at the time regarding the physics of particles and waves, right? So at the time, of course, everyone knew that matter consisted of particles, right? And particles were things that had a specific mass and a specific position, right? So particles have mass and specific position. Right. Whereas light, which is modeled as electromagnetic radiation, which we talked about in the last video, light is something that's massless, that has no special spe specific position. Right. It's delocalized. Right. So light, in contrast, is massless and delocalized. And I should say continuous as well. So massless, delocalized, and continuous. Right? So, you know, if you're looking at a particle or something that's made of particles, it has a specific mass, it has a specific position, and it's not a continuous entity. Versus light, electromagnetic radiation, was something that's seen as massless, it's delocalized, um, and it's continuous, right? And the prevailing wisdom is that there's no intermingling between these two ideas, right? That, that particles have their mass and position. Electromagnetic radiation has its wavelength and frequency. It's massless, delocalized, right? And there's no intermingling between these two ideas, right? So, um, so what are we looking at here, right? So this is a plot of something known as the spectrum of a black body. Now it's basically one word, right? So we're looking at a black body. And what a black body is, is any object that emits radiation in all regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So the sun is actually a black body, even though 90 plus percent of the light that it emits is in the UV region, it emits radiation in all regions. Or think about when you turn on an oven and the metal starts to get hot in the oven, it glows, right? That radiation that's coming off of hot metal or hot iron um, is a black body spectrum, right? It's emitting radiation in all regions of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So this is any material that emits in all regions of the electromagnetic spectrum. I'll put EMAG for short, EMAG spectrum, right? So that's a black body. And black bodies caused scientists a lot of headaches in the 1800s. And this is the reason why. So if you look at these, the red line, the green line, and the blue line are experimental curves taken from a black body spectrum. And you can see the intensity, um, or the, it, which is proportional to the energy, of the uh, of the black body that's the spectrum that's being emitted, right? So you can see that you know once it gets in the UV region, you get a lot of radiation in that region, and then it tails off until when you have you know no wavelength, no radiation, you have no intensity. Well, um, if you think about how this would be modeled in classical mechanics, right? So if we look at how we might model this in classical mechanics, in classical mechanics, the energy is proportional to the square of the frequency of the wave times K, which is the uh, Boltzmann constant, which is something you don't have to really know right now, times temperature, right? So the square of the frequency times temperature um, is going to be what the energy of, these, uh, of the electromagnetic radiation is proportional to. Now, what you'll notice here, right, is that um, as you at, at um, if you look at this black line, right, which is what you get from classical theory at 5000 Kelvin, you notice that at long wavelengths, right, classical theory isn't doing too bad, right? When we get to, to when we're out here at longer wavelengths, classical theory is modeling the energy fairly well. However, when you start to get to shorter wavelengths, right, 
you start to get a huge discrepancy between what you predict from classical theory and what you actually get experimentally. This is something that's known as the ultraviolet catastrophe. Ultraviolet catastrophe. And now that may seem rather dramatic, but it is, right? Look at this. If you look at this, look at how this equation is set up, right? As the uh, frequency increases, right? This energy is just going to keep going up and up and up and up and up and up, right? So obviously as this wavelength gets shorter, the frequency is going to continue to go up and up and get larger and larger. And then so this just goes off into infinity, right? It doesn't model the, what you see experimentally in any way. And this experimentally was one of the earliest indications that there was something wrong with uh, classical mechanics. And so how did we fix it? That's where Planck's law comes into play. So Planck's law basically redefines the energy of a wave, right? So the way that Planck's law defines the energy of the wave is the following, right? So we have a any type of energy change, delta E, is going to be equal to N, which is going to be any integer, H, which is going to be Planck's constant, and nu, which is the frequency, right? So nu you're already familiar with, right? This is the frequency. H is Planck's constant, which I'll give you the value for Planck's constant in just a second. And N, this is what makes this equation truly unique, right? N is just going to be any integer Right, so like, you know, one or two, three, dot, 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 right? Um, so N is just any integer, right? So instead of counting all of the frequencies, right? So this equation here from classical mechanics uh, counts all of the frequencies, right? Regardless of whether it's an integer or non-integer, right? It could be a decimal frequency, doesn't matter, right? Um, it's going to count it regardless. However, with Planck's law, you're basically counting discrete values of the energy and not counting everything. That goes against our traditional wisdom of electromagnetic radiation as being continuous, right? If you're only counting the energy contributions from integer uh, numbers, then that means you don't have a continuous function, right? So this is really the first indication that, you know, Something that we model as electromagnetic radiation, something that's that's light, actually has a property that's more akin to particles, right? Particles have these type of discrete countable energies, right? Light doesn't do that classically. So this is a, the first uh, kind of, I would say, amendment to classical mechanics that we need to consider. So this is known as Planck's law. And it gets that name from a uh, from a uh, late eight or uh, eighteen to nineteen hundred scientist Max Planck, um, who actually has a university named after him in Germany. Um, but yeah, so this so if we look at this equation, right? Let me give you the value for Planck's constant so you can know what that number is. So H is going to be equal to six point six two six times ten to the negative thirty four joules time seconds. Now, if you look at this number, it is extremely, extremely small, right? Um, which should cue you into the fact that this is only really applicable in situations where you have really small particles, right? Really minute energy changes. We're getting down to a very granular level when something, some number like this starts to become really, really important, right? So basically what Planck's law was able to do here is uh, correct this curve from classical physics. When you use Planck's law, you actually reproduce the experimental data exactly. Um, and this is our first insight here into um, you know, a, a problem with classical mechanics and our first hint that you know, things that are, are defined classically as electromagnetic radiation, things like light, might have some properties that we might need to borrow from particles.